Let me share my screen here. Yeah. All right, so the theory goes that everybody should see that now. All right, well, how software quality affects cycle times. So I can't see any of you. So normally I'd ask who is a, uh, I mean, I guess everybody's in QA, but who is a project manager, things like that. But uh, I can't see any of you. So I guess we can't do that. Um, first of all, welcome. And um, there's this sort of, mythical thing about software quality. What, so we're going to take a look at uh, what it is and how, what, what makes good quality and uh, how it affects cycle times. So for those of you who, I mean, what, what is cycle time? It's basically the time from we want it to it's live, right? So uh, in a nutshell, software being developed iteratively. It means that um, if you, the, the shorter your cycle time to build a certain feature or product, uh, the, the more kicks at the can you get in a way, right? So cycle time is everything from initial planning to development to QA to any automated or manual deployment you may need to do uh, and so forth. So soup to nuts, how long does it take? There's often a kind of a, a uh, the notion that uh, somehow in project planning, this is mainly the time you spent actually coding this stuff or sitting down doing test cases if you do manual testing, that kind of thing. But we, we'll see that there are many other factors in this. A lot of it is actually nothing happens and uh, a given issue just sits in some backlog or something that, that all features into that, right? Uh, so um, specifically for um, situations where you uh, so how does that affect quality? Uh, let's have a look at that. So software quality is about bugs, right? Let's, let's simplify it down to that. And um, good quality software is determined, hey, hey, how many bugs did we find? I mean, we, we kind of, we found quite a lot of bugs, so that software is obviously no good, right? So, um, but that's not all of it. Uh, there's another thing that's kind of harder to assess, the bugs that never happened, right? The, uh, the, uh, the squeaky wheel gets the grease kind of thing. I've seen this before in, in systems where in an organization, that system, no one ever touches it. It just sits there quietly. It makes its money or does its thing. And um, no one just no And so this kind of thing is almost under the radar, but that's the quality is there and it needs uh, very little maintenance. It just, it just does its thing quietly. It adapts when it needs to change it when it has to. So mostly you hear about the systems which are way more uh, broken, but then it's not the other factor in this is, well, what, hey Robert. Yes. Uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt you. I, yep. I was just curious if you're sharing your screen, because uh, we, we don't see. I am sharing screen. We don't actually see your screen share. You don't. That's bad. All right. So that would be bad because I'm halfway through a bunch of slides. All right. I have not ever used, tried to use Microsoft Teams for this, so this is unfamiliar. One moment, let's try this again. Uh, all right, so you, you, you cannot see me sharing my screen is what you're saying? Yes, we can. All right, so that would be a problem. It's a Microsoft bug. Yes, about software quality. All right, so now you should see what I, my screen, yes? Uh, yeah, we, yes. we do your, we do see your screen. Now. Excellent. Can you see the slide? Yes. Can you see the yes. slide now? You see the yes. slides now. Perfect. Excellent. So that now, anyway, where were we? So thanks, thanks for that hint. As I say, I'm totally unfamiliar with Microsoft Teams. All right. 
cycle time, we, 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 you saw that, right? It's a time to complete the production process of one product, soup to nuts. We talked about that. And um, software quality is about the bugs we found, the bugs that never happened. But then there's another less uh, tangible thing, right? Uh, you can have uh, software quality kind of isn't absolute. If this is a system which hardly ever needs to change, you just slap it together any uh, any way you want. And uh, it, it really doesn't have the quality, but it's really, it's not that apparent after you fix the initial slew of bugs because the requirement, there, there are no new features, right? There's no need to evolve, no need to change because a lot of the quality issues only come up once you, it's a version two thing, right? You can, in version one, you, well, the system is still small. You can get away with a lot. Version two is another matter. Version two is when suddenly the code base grows and everything goes slower and so on. So number of bugs you find, lack of bugs, and how fast is it to change that thing? Because most software these days does need to change and need to change fast. And a lot of uh, what we're going to look at today is how to make, how to, how to use better quality software to speed up the ability of systems to adapt and to do new features. So let's have a look at this. I mean, they, they, this, this is, you've all heard this, right? Fixing bugs late is expensive. Uh, the earlier you find an issue, the, the, uh, the, the quicker it is. Uh, it's the time, the elapsed time from we want it to its life, right? If you do automated testing, I uh, hope you can see my cursor here, right? And you kind of find your bugs in air quotes right at the, at the time when you do unit tests, all the rest of it, this comes together quickly. Uh, it, you get, uh, you, you find it here and it, it, it's qu it's quickly addressed, then things go into, your build is finished, then you go into QA production, obviously the sim a simplified uh, version of the whole thing. So then let's look by contrast, let's look at um, what this looks like if QA finds a bug. You de a developers build it, then QA tests, oh dear, they find a bug. Uh, the, the bug is found, the bug is fixed by the developer, it goes back into QA, it, then it goes into prod, right? So that takes a little longer because it needs, there's more delays, right? It needs, to, we're going to look at the reasons for that, why, why this is, it, it's, it, why this takes a little longer if you do that here. And then, of course, the ultimate, you only find that in production, right? There's a build, QA, production, then you find that bug, it's fixed, goes, and you do another release of whatever kind. The last one is obviously the one we don't want to see. And also, this is shown as more or less <clears throat> linear. In, in reality, it's, uh, it, it's actually... You, they, they all saw that it's exponentially more expensive if you find it in or more time consuming. If you find it in production, it turns out to be, uh, I heard it's not quite true. I mean, in my own experience too, it's like, it's not exponential, but it's like 10 times as long. It uh, That takes in terms of elapsed time. And so why is that, right? If, if the developer just goes and fixes it, finds she or her, he find it themselves, it takes not very, not very long. <clears throat> But then as it sort of moves down the line, the later it's found, the more expensive it is. So that then is, let's take a look at this, right? Uh, I think it's due to handoffs because each time a handoff is sort of, like a develop, uh, 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 it's a handoff between people, right? Someone has to ask someone else to do something or explain something to somebody and so on. And so if it's found during dev, there's only one person involved. So zero handoffs. There's no project planning to do because it just happens as part of whatever a sprint. And of course, there are no production deployments. You just basically no one that that in air quotes, bug never sees the light of day, right? So 
let's look at what that what happens during QA if it's found later. Now there there are more people involved, right? Uh, you have uh, three handoffs of could be something like that. So the tester finds the bug and then uh, so logs it in JIRA or whatever. The project manager and the team in their planning assign it to be fixed from some backlog. It's handed off to developer. Uh, so QA then is planning, the hand off to the developer, then hand off back to QA after it's deployed. So you can see how there's more elapsed time happening, just because um, it's unless it's a hot fix, it's probably going to be in the next sprint or at least the next release. Uh, so th there's just time where that thing just sits there. Uh, waiting to be resourced and so forth. Uh, that uh, so, of course, the, the the bigger your system is, the more complex that gets, we, we, and the more work in progress you have, the more complex that gets. And uh, sure, um, it delays your production deployment potentially, but there's no production deployment here yet. And then you look at what it looks like if it's found on prod. Um, by the way, it's, I had kind of planned to have this a little bit more interactive, but I can't see any of you. And it's uh, so, so you just type away with questions in the chat and we leave enough time at the big, at the end. So we get a, um, we, we get ourselves a, a good Q and A towards the end. So here it's all sorts of people are involved, right? There's a deployment that already happened. So there's some kind of ops perhaps involved, a support person who gets a phone call from the irate or otherwise customer who is hampered by the bug. So there's the support guys who need to uh, talk to developers or QA or PMs, depending how it's all organized. And so you see lots of handoffs uh, up, uh, and a lot of opportunity that this is just kind of stuck somewhere in some pipeline of tasks, right? So this, so it's not just the fixing of the bug, it's also the number of people and activities which need to coordinate, which need to be coordinated, which matter a lot. Uh, so th the lesson is the later it's found, the the, uh, the 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 more expensive it gets. We will look at sort of in the next segment how 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 one can get around that up to a point. Uh, but uh, in in the end, you have this sort of uh, in in big legacy systems, you have this. Uh, um, some of you might have heard that there's a release train strategy for releasing legacy, right? Uh, so it's basically just like a train. We have a release once a month on the 28th or whatever, right? Or on the last Thursday, on the last Wednesday of the month, there's a release for every team. All work which makes it through QA by that time goes into that release, and it's how you can establish a bit of a cadence if you have one giant mixed together legacy system. Uh, because uh, if you not do that and you allow all the teams and everybody to just release more or less ad hoc, uh, you you you'd never see the end of regression testing. You, it would be chaos, and uh, in a large complex bug prone system. And so you just say, well, if you know that it's the last Wednesday of the month where it's a re release time, then uh, you can bunch up all the, all the regression testing for all the various fixes starting the week before and so forth and, and, and get some semblance of order to it. But of course, it means that you're, you're still releasing slowly, right? Let's say you find a bug uh, if it's not some sort of a uh, hot fix or something, you find an issue or a feature which does, or, or, or want a feature and it's the beginning of the month, you know it's going to take at least a month uh, for it to get into production. And then only if it makes it through all the checks and balances and development and so on by the end of the month. So that's very suboptimal. And it also doesn't improve your software. You, you still have that legacy and you're still sort of, you sort of, a trundling along in a, in a sort of suboptimal, not very well optimized for speed way. 
So no one moves faster than the train. So the stakes of late discovery of bugs are kind of even higher, can delay you for a long time. Um, so how, how do we fix that? Um, uh, there is a, um, th that's a haystack, right? See the needle to the right? Uh, needle haystack. So you, you have these big legacy systems and um, if bugs are needles, the smaller the haystack, the easier it is to find and fix them. Uh, this is the what's clean code. What what's what's well? Turns out clean or not clean. The, the the overwhelming factor for how bug prone a lack of code is, or how easy to maintain it is, is really uh, the size of the code base. Um, you, it's very easy to see, uh, to see, uh, to understand and debug uh, a, a whack of code, which is only five, like a, a few screens long, and you can sort of see it, or even smaller, right? So the smaller the code base, uh, the easier it is to find bugs. The easier it is to under, uh, it is to go through the haystack and understand what's hidden in there and all the rest of it. So the the key to fast cycle times really is a small code base. Of course, for the most part, we don't have that. We work on uh, bigger syst big systems, multiple teams, multiple developers, and so forth. So, so how, 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 how can you work with that? Um, because if you have a larger haystack, it just means that you're in this release train or similar scenario where the waiting time and the handoffs and the disconnect just can, can kind of keep increasing. So uh, how do we break that down? So um, just to sum, just to summarize, uh, software quality of, of what we've seen so far. Software quality really is a function of size. Uh, the bigger the code base, the more, the less, uh, the, the 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 harder it gets to keep it uh, bug free and and of high quality. Um, Speed of delivery is also a function of size. The bigger the thing is, which you need to put in every release, the more regression testing, the, the more the less wieldy it gets. So small is beautiful, and uh, the smaller the code base, the faster it is to build, test, and deploy, which is great in theory, but it leaves us with what's what do we mean by code base? And how do we make it smaller? So let's take a look at that. Um, let's look at a hypothetical bike share system. Think Vancouver bike share with those stations and what have you, right? And um, note the version number to the right. Let's say this is version 1.1.0. And that haystack is the entire bike share system, soup to nuts from user registration to uh, those stations, uh, locations where you can get a bike to tracking rides to make sure they return the whole 10 yards. It's let's say it's one big legacy system, and it's so bike share 1.1 is followed by bike share 1.1.1, eventually bike share 1.2. So different versions, and it, it, it's a sort of one big haystack gen gently trundling uh, towards its eventual destination. Many systems. Uh, I like that, of course, as no doubt some of you work on larger legacy systems that tend to do that. So how do you break that up? Well, what's a code base coming back to what we said earlier? It's the smallest thing. For, there, there are a couple of definitions, right? But uh, for the purposes of getting faster cycle times and higher quality software, uh, let's go with this. The smallest thing that can be versioned, tested, and deployed independently, also known as a standalone service. There's, uh, and there's, of course, those of you, some of you, no doubt, work in a sort of a service-oriented or microservices kind of environment. There's forever the eternal question of what's the difference between a good service and a bad service. Uh, I, I show you at, at the end of the presentation, we're going to have uh, the, ulti the only test that matters for a service. So I'm going to show you a QA trick, how you can tell at a glance whether a service is well designed and high quality or not, but we, we, we'll get there. So uh, if it's small and it can be version tested and deployed independently, they can all have their own little mini 
release trains, if you will. And the shorter, the smaller this is, the quicker it can iterate, the faster you can fix bugs, and 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 it can iterate towards being good software faster. So what we want is really a whole bunch of uh, we, we we want lots of little haystacks, so it's easier to find all those needles, right? Uh, so let's say that very same bike share system, I should, uh, Vancouver bike share, I should have picked blue colors for the haystacks, but let's say it's got, uh, users can register for it. Uh, they're either paid up members or not. So there's a membership service. And of course, they need we need to they need to register a credit card or pay for programs, whatever. So a payment service here, and um, those locations you need to know how many bikes are there, all the rest of it, and um, you need to track that member A just took bike Z and went from this location to this other place is currently in transit. So you can uh, build that member if appropriate or, or check membership status and, and so forth, ensure the bike is returned. And of course, there's a bike maintenance system, uh, which maintenance is, well, you need to make sure there's enough bikes at every location. You need to fix them up as you go, whatever that may mean, right? So th this is what our bike share system kind of breaks down into. Lots of smaller haystacks, and you can see the version numbers here, right? You, you have a the smaller services, and the, the, each one has its own independent release cycle. For example, user registration is at version one five thirteen, payment services at o one nine, and membership service is at one point two. And ride tracker is already at 2.1. And you can sort of see how, and so forth, right? You can sort of see how the different developers or teams uh, made those calls. For example, payment service just sits there. It's a generic kind of pretty well understood functionality. It didn't need, it's not quite at version one, but we found that the pre release 091 is good enough. It changes very little, it just sits there. Um, similar for membership, we appear to, it's a sort of run of the mill SaaS style membership thing. We appear to have gotten it right uh, after version one and a couple of patch up releases and additional features, we're good to go. Ride tracker on the other hand, that's a user experience thing, right? Uh, it's we, we wanna make sure we get that right because uh, if, if these people feel that are not, uh, they, they, for whatever reason, it can trigger more customer support issues and so forth. So we, that that needed a few more revisions and iterations. User registration too. We, we improved the UX, so and now we're up to version one five thirteen. You can see how each one of those has its own release cycle, and obviously the cycle times of every individual one are fast, right? You have a uh, these can be independently owned by different teams or developers, and they don't really need to coordinate all that much for starters. If this is done right, and again, we have the ultimate test for what right actually means in that. Uh, it, later, it's, uh, it's a bit tongue in cheek, but it's nonetheless something which is actually done by some pretty big guys like Google and Facebook and so on. But bottom line is, if this can be independently owned by different teams, and they don't have to have meetings with each other all the time to coordinate releases, that speeds up things too. Also, if a new version of user registration comes out, and they can do that without QA needing to regression test all of these things, right? Uh, in one giant release train release, it cuts down regression test effort dramatically, right? Uh, you, there, there's a, of course, it means that there mustn't be any side effects. If user registration blows up the other things, uh, then you have a problem. Uh, wherein lies the, the crux of it, the actual difficulty. So if you look at this, this is kind of what software looks like. It's like, it's called a Volpertinger. It's a Bavaria thing, right? The, the, the German accent thing, you never get rid of it anyway. If you look at most systems, this is kind of, it's neither fish nor fowl nor rabbit. It, 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 this is actually based on an Albrecht Dürer rabbit, which has been suitably modified, but you can see uh, bits of bits and pieces, right? It's got antlers, it's got wings, it's it's got uh, some some whatever this is, uh, teeth which rabbits don't have and so on. And that's sort of what 
that that giant bike share system where all of these concerns are mixed together. Uh, that's sort of what that looks like. It's sort of a hybrid where it's not clear what all the pieces belong to. And this is, as I say, it's a Bavarian sort of folk myth. It's called a Wolpertinger, a blend of different creatures. You know, you're not quite sure what it is. And so the, the task software engineering is basically about breaking up that Wolpertinger giant haystack into bits which can be versioned and deployed independently. So when you look at software engineering, it's really mostly about managing coupling and cohesion. Everything that changes together is in the same place and it doesn't blow other stuff up. And uh, that it, it gets us significantly out of scope to get into that. It's very difficult as systems grow and uh, the industry as a whole we're only really beginning to understand now uh, what, how to do this right. It's it's um, it, it, it's well understood in almost anywhere else, like cars, uh, for example, where having sort of distinct subsystems, which are independent from each other, is pretty normal, right? It's understood that uh, your airbags won't malfunction. If uh, your, um, I don't know, your electric windows break and things like that in software, that's not a given, uh, but we're getting there, right? In that sense, cars are small, easier to own and easier to maintain haystacks. That's out of context. That would be a very strange statement, I guess. So um, which kind of brings us to the test that really matters the one I mentioned earlier, you have how, let's say you do this, there's some magic where your developers, and if you're developers, you, you kind of manage to actually break this apart, right? You have your, these different services, all the rest of it. How, how do you know you have mixed things together and you still have a Wolpertinger? Well, it's easy. The, te the only test that matters for a service-oriented or microservice architecture is this one. In a nutshell, turn all the other stuff up. Does your right tracker service still work? So that, that's really the ultimate test that they're loosely coupled. Uh, that's less insane than it sounds. Uh, the monkey wrenching, I think Google, the, Google and Facebook, for example, call that differently, but they routinely sort of deliberately turn off services at random and see if things still work uh, because it's, uh, it's a great test for that. They do that in their live systems. Uh, so it's a great test for whether, whether the software engineering sort of met its goal. So how, how, so in this situation, uh, okay, existing members can still go to a location. The map where they see how many bikes there are in that location may not be accurate anymore, uh, but let's assume they find a bike, uh, which is physically there. They can still check it out in the ride tracker and, and go riding and, and return it somewhere else. Now, because the ride tracker is still up. That's a good thing, right? Not the entire bike sharing system is down. Uh, at least existing members can still use it. You can't do bike maintenance anymore. And uh, no one knows what, it, what actually is at the various occasions. No new users can register. No one can purchase anything and we don't proce process any payments. And uh, the membership status of anybody who, who of, of, uh, are they paid up or in arrears or whatever, of anybody who takes those rides out is unknown. But bottom line is people can still get their bikes and, and all the rest of it. So that's, that's insane. How does that work? Well, that comes with that sort of state of the art 2020, where these systems are kind of eventually consistent. So you get yourself, obviously, well, this person takes out that bike and let's say that costs $2.95, we still want to eventually charge a credit card. So this publishes a, let's say, a ride, a bike checked out event, uh, which, which sits in a queue somewhere. The payment service listens to it and, and respects and, and, and eventually catches up from that queue and processes all payments it missed while it was down. So it comes up eventually 
and recovers and you say, right, what did I miss? Oh, I, I need to process the following 50 payments or whatever, right? So this is, it, it's actually old technology. You can do this with batch, with old fashioned batch jobs as well as modern fully event driven systems. Doesn't really matter. But the point is, no matter if you use batch jobs or any other technology, uh, that service can catch up it's designed in a way so it can catch up on things it missed if it goes down. Same for location service. All right, um, what did I miss? Oh, somebody took uh, five, bi uh, three bikes were taken from location 15 and uh, two of those were returned to location 16 and another th three to locations 18, 17 and 14, right? So the bottom line is the question you're asking is, does it still work? If you switch any one of those are off, that's in my mind the ultimate validation for any kind of service-oriented architecture. If if that doesn't hold true and it's achievable, this is sort of state-of-the-art engineering. Then it your design is probably it should from a quality perspective I might want need to go back to the would be good to get back to the drawing board because you stand to make a much better system. Of course, it works for this too, right? Um, if everything's down, only user registration is open, then at least you still get new users in. They might be frustrated because they can't check out new bikes, but you can. it's still better than nothing. So it means that you can give your uh, status updates. Uh, it's not, oh, the bike sharing system is down. It's actually, well, the ride tracker is up, Location services are up, but uh, we can't register new users and we can't process payments. Okay, you can work with that, right? It's, you can, you, 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 it's better than a global, everything's broken. And that's very much the hallmark of good software that it, it, it has smaller pieces and um, they don't blow each other up. That allows you to have those faster release cycles for every single one of them. The risk of blowing things up is simply less. All right, you bought, uh, you 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 release the new version of the membership service. It it crashed and burned, and uh, and cr it crashes in production. Okay, that's fine. The rest of the system. Uh, will still work with a known set of things which no longer work. And uh, you're aware of what this will be and you make your risk management and mitigation and, and the depth of your testing accordingly. You're good to go. Cars have done that for a long time, right? Uh, the windscreen wipers don't work and the, and the wiper fluid is empty, but you can still drive. So this is normal for all the other machinery we use every day, all day long. Um, it's just software hasn't quite caught up with that yet. So um, the only test that matters for service-oriented architecture, can you turn off all this other stuff and your service still works? And can you uh, turn, turn off your service and the rest of it still works? So um, in a nutshell, test early. So the, the earlier you test and find things, the faster your cycle times are going to be. Smaller services lead to a faster turnaround. And then there's, of course, the $10 million question of what a service actually is. And from a project management perspective and cycle time perspective, uh, the, that would be a, a good definition. Certainly I found useful is it's independently releasable and loosely coupled. The latter means, well, you can turn it off and the entire system won't go down. Or uh, if everything else is turned off, it can still, because it has its own database and all the rest of it, operate independently. The data may be stale, but it's still working. So that would be the, the, the hallmark of that. So now this would be the part where we could have some sort of a, a bit of Q&A happening. Just go back here. 
Yes, if anyone has any questions, um, feel free to either unmute yourself and ask out loud or you type it in the chat. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Robert. That was, I actually understood it. So that says a lot. <laughs> so I think you did a really great job of, you know, breaking it down into. It's the audio quality. It's the audio quality. <laughs> yeah. Did anyone have any questions at all? Or any comments, maybe, or how this relates to you know the system you're using at work or something you're working on. So D said, "Is it a real story or a fi fictional example?" Oh dear, I told so many. I told so many stories. So, uh, this is this is sort of a uh, amalgamate of. This it's based on the real story, sort of amalgamate of several. And uh, it's it it mirrors. I had to. I couldn't use the actual example uh, because that's kind of a bit proprietary. But I was actually I was actually uh, that bike share example actually came from. Oh, I can't tell that story for real, where we had to break, uh, do a lot of this kind of legacy re-engineering re work. And so I was thinking about that while I was walking. I was walking around some Saturday morning on the way to the coffee shop. I thought I need a good example. And I actually walked by not the, the, the another bike share system, not the one in Vancouver, but I actually walked by one of those bike share systems, like the ones they have in Victoria, where you have not where you get, I'd never seen this this system before. I thought, okay, let's see what the quality of the app is. I've never seen the system. I didn't install the app. It's raining. It's cold. It's miserable. And before my first coffee, let's. Let me install the app, sign up, credit card and all, and see how long it takes and how smooth it goes to check out a bike and actually use it right here. And and so this is actually the, the, so this is where I got that example from by reverse engineering an actual I won't tell you which one bike sharing app which is uh, in use in the outskirts of Vancouver and so on, and uh, this is sort of reverse engineering with event with reverse event storming that system, and then kind of using it for that type of example. It's an amalgamation of several real things. Well, can you read the question to Robert? So, if the company <laughs> were to move from monolith to microservices, how would they start? By forgetting everything about microservices and instead how, I've learned first how to build a monolith properly. That's another, for example, in the Microsoft space, um, what a service, and I'm not sure how technical we can get here, but in a Microsoft space, this is since the dawn age, like 2002, when it first, I think that's when it came out, uh, out in uh, .NET framework version. The, the versionable thing, the ones I showed earlier, right? The, the important thing is, what's the what's this unit you can assign a version number to and, and therefore give it an independent release cycle if it's designed right in microsoft this has always been assemblies it still is even in this in, in the dot net uh, core stuff and so on it's an assembly because assemblies are what a version number belongs to so a service is an assembly uh, it, it's wrapped by things. You can toss it into a Docker container. You can wire it together with dependency injection as one does in ASP.NET MVC. And one always did that. It's a startup.cs file, but there's no conceptual difference between uh, between that and the Docker container. So you have yourself a, uh, a, a, basically your service is that versionable assembly and uh, the API of a service is defined by the public methods of that assembly. So the first, and, and you have to kind of, I feel you have to kind of learn how to walk before you can run. So first uh, learn how to build monoliths where those assemblies with or without NuGet uh, uh, can be swapped out cleanly. And it has all those little haystack characteristics without side effects and so on, which we saw earlier on. 
only then does it make sense to even think about microservices uh, because your microservices project, if you do this, if you don't get those boundaries between your haystacks right and they blow each other up and you can't release them as uh, independently from each other, that's sort of manageable in DLL hell with your, I mean, I mean the Microsoft space at the moment. So the example from that, right? It, it's, 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 but good luck with that. If that stuff runs in different services and things don't happen in a predictable order anymore. Once you have it in Docker, once you toss those assemblies, wrap them into Docker containers and so on, uh, then it gets a lot more complicated. So I don't think it makes sense to go to microservices unless you first get really good at manage, managing coupling and cohesion in the monolith. I know that's somewhat heretical. Everybody wants to uh, to play with Kuba, sling containers around in Kubernetes and play with all the cool stuff and all the rest of it. But really, it's like, it's going to hurt. You're going to have yourself a distributed monolith if you don't follow certain engineering practices. And uh, uh, it's, it's, it's going to be even more horrific than your old monolith. Did anyone else have any questions at all? Or is anyone working um, like your current organization, you know, using microservices or thinking about implementing them? Could I? I'm not sure if this hand raising actually works. I, I can see nearly nothing. Uh, um, oh, I see we have, have a, a question, question here. here. Oh, dear. Uh, so how is the job market in Vancouver these days? Is it very difficult? Are there a lot of layoffs? And who is growing right now? I kind of want to like also open this up to the group. If anyone you know, has had any, any experience they want to share, maybe like um, if they've had a lot of layoffs at their organization or you know, like are finding things difficult or are, is our company growing? There's actually people who are hiring too right now, so. Um, a couple of people who responded in the chat. Well, um, Ivana, do you want to? Do you mind if I unmute you? Did you want to talk a little bit about the educational organization at UBC and how that's growing? <laughs> I unmute people. You mean you have no virtual pizza? We're working on it. <laughs> Maybe you guys can build an app for it. I don't know. <laughs> Teleported pizza. <laughs> I'm sure it would make a lot of money during the times right now. So. <laughs> yep. You know, I, I'm dying to try the hand raising thing. The, 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 see, everybody seems to have a hand raising button. Who, who is uh, uh, who is a developer among the audience? Let's try if the hand raising actually works. I can't see anything. I'm assuming most people are QA, but I'm just curious. I don't see any hands. It should show up in the participant list. All right, let's try. Who's a? Let, let's do who's QA. Oh, got a few more there. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought so. So uh, I'm hoping the, the sort of sidebar in diving deep into what's a service in .NET uh, kind of made a modicum of sense. But it's, um, I, I really think this 
trick of asking your developers what happens if their my if 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 their microservice still works if you, they turn up all other turn off all other microservices it really is the ultimate test for the quality of the thing somewhat biased in that opinion but can't go wrong with that i think uh, oh yeah here's a question do, do, do release trains make sense when every team can anyway release independent of each other? But that's the beauty of it, right? If you have, if you do have a true microservice environment, uh, it doesn't matter if it's a well-designed monolith with, with, with sort of services and assemblies or whether it's actual microservices, as long as everybody can release that stuff independently, you don't need the release trains anymore, right? That's the beauty of it. That's where the speed comes from. You can release every haystack or every service or whatever you call it uh, as often as you like. And uh, that's where the speed comes from. So the, the answer is absolutely no. If, if you've done it, if, if you've done your services right, the, the goal is that you don't need uh, that kind of thing anymore. All right. Could I? Yeah, integration testing. That's always a. Uh, that's always a thing, which is. It's a very good question, because, uh, in the end, you have to test end to end. Uh, for uh, for because you are composing a larger solution from those individual components, and so um, there are the obvious things. Like uh, I'm not sure if Selenium is st still a thing. Uh, kind of hoping it isn't. I'm not too down on testing, but uh, it's it was complete. It's basically unless you do a sort of user interface first testing, where you where you, where, where you do solely user interface driven testing it gets kind of yeah I, i've actually used I've, I've started using i had the chance to look at cypress uh, in a previous project i liked it a lot actually but the point is you get yourself a nice uh, user interface based set of tests for integration tests that works but then the issue with anything more complex is in my experience, I've seen this over and over again, is to have consistent test data, right? And so um, how, let's say all of your little Haystack services, part of being independent is that they need their own real or, or at least logical data, data stores. So they, it, the data may be stale, but they can keep working off their local stuff if any, everything else goes down. And then eventually through events or other mechanisms, they get the latest state and so on. That makes it even more on the face of it makes it even more difficult to have a consistent data set for that kind of end-to-end -end test. There, there is, there's a number of answers. The one I've employed in the wild most recently was that was an, not an event source system, but event driven system where you could rebuild a bunch of those databases by hosing a bunch, by hosing events uh, at through Kafka in this case, uh, which which populates the databases. So what you can do, we're not quite there yet, but what, what you can do is you can have, for example, let's say you use Postgres, you can have a Docker container with Postgres, which is populated with the right kind of set, test data uh, every time before every test run. And then uh, also UI-based end-to-end tests are possible. That's messy and complicated. Uh, I'm guessing that a number of you probably have run into this, but um, Cypress.io together with some sort of trick to get consistent test data is really the only thing that's truly integration end to end. With all that, uh, there is it's there's less need for it. Uh, there's little need to test individual business rules. It's literally just checking if all the pieces hang together. Uh, the benefit of having much smaller services is that the tests, which more cohesive, right, is that the, the tests of every individual one are a lot more can be a lot more fine grained and meaningful. Complex topic, but test data is where the is the devil in the details, I think.
Did that answer the, the, the question somewhat? The answer is kind of that there is no good answer, but okay. <laughs> Um, are there any other questions from the group before we wrap up? Oh my God, other than a car, what is Fiat? <laughs> Seriously, I'm not, unless it's the car, I'm actually not familiar with the acronym. <laughs> Well, we know your video is working then, so. <laughs> That's good. I can't see any of you. It's like literally talking to, to the walls. Actually, I, am, I was just talking to the wall. Um, you know, that was just kind of here, but uh, nice cars. <laughs> well, on that note, um, I think we'll just wrap things up then. <laughs> okay. Thank you so well, much, Lexus Robert. Is most, yeah, anyway, yeah. thanks. Yeah. Our next, maybe next one of our other future Van Q's, we'll just debate, you know, different car brands. Um, but <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you so much, Robert, for presenting today and, you know, sharing about uh, microservices and, you know, these different kind of, like, how we're transitioning from monolith to microservices and what kind of these challenges are. Um, I'll let Shoba kind of wrap up for us so that you guys know about our next thank you as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was nice. Thank you. Sorry, I was on. Yeah, I was on mute. Uh, yeah. So, firstly, uh, thanks a lot, Robert, for that presentation, and uh, we had a really good round of Q and A. And thanks to all the participants who joined us. Uh, for our next Van Q, we'll have that on July thirtieth, where we have Michael from Cobalt. Uh, he'll be presenting, and we'll dis uh, we'll update you guys with the topic on our social media as well as the meetup page. Uh, besides this, we are also running a webinar series uh, on uh, tech tools for a post-COVID work environment, and this is happening on July 23rd. So if uh, any of you want to attend that, uh, you can check out more details on that on our website under events. And yeah, looking forward to seeing all of you for the next webinar. And thanks a lot, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Have a great night. Thank you.